you for joining us at the forum on using and sharing research data about child uh, children to child, child well-being um, and especially thank you for the speakers who took time today uh, to contribute uh, their knowledge and experience with, with us. Um, just briefly, I would like to share uh, some information on today's uh, agenda and about the speakers and our facilitator. Um, so the introductory part um, um, will uh, be provided by myself. My name is Sonia and I will talk about a consortium of European, so European Social Science Data Archives and its services. Um, then uh, Markus Tuominen uh, from the Finnish Social Science Data Archive will speak about um, data discovery. Um, uh, Inge Sieben uh, from Tilburg University will uh, introduce us with the Atlas of European Values. Um, then uh, our colleague from Slovenia, from the Institute for Social S uh, Studies from Koper, Mateja Sedmak, will talk about um, her experiences with uh, collecting data, um, including children. Um, at the end, my colleague from Social, uh, Slovenian Social Science Data Archives, Irena vipauts uh will lead the discussion and, and there will be also time for your questions and we will ask you to raise your hand and then unmute yourself and take part in the discussion. And uh, behind the scene, there is our colleague Sergeja who will uh, kindly take care about the, the technical um, uh, issues. So now uh, it's time to talk about the CESDA uh, and all the various services that we provide for researchers all over the Europe. Uh, so CESDA is the abbreviation for the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. Um, the mission of this really huge umbrella organization is to provide a sustainable research infrastructure, uh, which enables the research community to conduct high quality research in the social sciences. Um, it contributes to effective solutions to the major challenges facing society today. At least this is our uh, wish, so to say. Um, key, task, key tasks that uh, we are providing at CESDA are developing standards and best practices around the management and archiving of social science data. Uh, we do facilitate access to important data resources uh, and quite a lot of efforts uh, are invested into the development of tools, uh, providing training and also coordinating the network all over the Europe. Um, and let's check which countries are actually uh, uh, service providers at CESDA. Can you go to the next slide, please? Ah, that's not another. Can you go back, Irina? <laughs> Sorry. So as you can see, there are really like uh, too many, um, many countries already uh, included as members, full members of, of CISDA. There are 22 of them. And there are many of them also were um, aiming to become members and to um, somehow uh, help to create this infrastructure uh, even better. So what uh, we are... Uh, especially proud of uh, are our digital tools. Uh, so since the data catalog is for sure the most important uh, product that we provide um, and uh, Markus Tuominen from Finnish Social Science Data Archive will later talk about this service. Uh, but there are also some others like uh, European Language Social Science Thesaurus uh, or European Question Bank or Vocabulary Service. Uh, which we can also talk a little bit about later if you're interested. Um, you can raise questions in the discussion part. Uh, then since the training activities are also very um, relevant, I would say, here uh, at the web page of CISDA, you can find um, uh, the whole range of various activities, um, like um, the seminar that we are um uh, providing today is not the only one. There were many uh, in the past and there are recordings available on the web, web page. Um, when one very also relevant is the data management expert guide, which is um, actually um, 
kind of a guidebook uh, about the data management and it's very useful and uh, we recommend you to go through it if you're collecting your own data um, and many, many other um, useful uh, training materials are available on the web page. Uh, with this slide, I wanted really to stress that behind the scene, there are um, a lot of um, teams um, spread all over the Europe that are working hard in the data archives to, to uh, take care uh, about social science data. Um, so they are listed here. Um, and today we, would, we will try to tell you a bit more about the Slovenian Social Science Data Archive and about Finnish Social Science Data Archive. But this is just to give you the idea. Uh, and I recommend you to go and check uh, service providers at your own countries or at the, on the level of CISDA. So let's check what what is to tell about the Slovenian Social Science Data Archives. Um, our archive was established uh, in 1997. Um, we have a status of being a Slovenian National Research Data Center for Social Sciences. Um, we do collaborate with more than 19 uh, 90 uh, various um, research organizations. Uh, so some of them were our depositors already in the past. With some of them, we are still collaborating. Uh, so just that you get the idea that there are really many uh, organizations that we are working with. Um, as already said, we are a member of uh, CISDA and also collaborating a lot with other service providers from uh, different countries. Um, also very relevant is, um, is the fact that we have a status of being a trustworthy data archive, so we are capable to take care for your data sets on the long uh, term, and we uh, get our knowledge or we widen our knowledge in various uh, European and national projects. Um, okay. Um, yeah, here we wanted to give you the idea what we are actually uh, taking care of, what are our tasks in the data archives at, at CISDA. Uh, so what are our services that we provide to our uh, users, uh, depositors of research studies? Uh, so we do acquire uh, documents and data files from uh, different research projects. We do process them, we store them, we curate, um, store the data on the long term. Um, we do actively disseminate data, so we make promotional activities. Uh, we do assist uh, users that are interested in, in your data sets so that they can understand this data and use them for different uh, purposes. Uh, and we also provide expertise on methodology and research instruments. So you can really see that there is uh, uh, extensive uh, services that we can offer to research communities. Um, now, uh, from now on, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the typical questions that are asked uh, from researchers when they contact us. Uh, and the answers are good to be uh, answered uh, before you start uh, your uh, research um, so that you are able to avoid some uh, common and challenging situations before uh, publish your data. Um, so the first question that we often uh, are asked is, uh, what actually do you mean when you say research data? So research data are primary sources that underpin scientific research and that enable derivation of theoretical or applied findings. Um, this research data can be um, uh, collected by different uh, methods. Um, this can be, for example, opinion polls, surveys, interviews, could be also mass media, social media, laboratory experiments, some fieldwork notes, demographic records, voting records, or it could be also uh, data from newspapers, photographies, video materials, letter, diaries. So it's really a huge variety of, uh, of uh, methods that can be used to collect uh, the social science and humanities data. Um, so the data you can uh, generate by your own, you can obtain it from other researchers, you can get it from data repositories. 
or from libraries, archives, museums, and, and so on. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, then what we also ask um, researchers when they want to publish the data with us in what form format is your data? Is it textual, numerical, multimedia? Is it structured software? And also, is it like really small and simple data set or is it a large and you deal with complex data files? Because all of this is very relevant that we uh, can get ready your data on time. Next slide, please. Um, since we are today talking about data, including children, it's very important to stress that um, we take we need to take care uh, when we deal with personal data and in social sciences and humanities, personal data are quite common and very often uh, processed. And personal data are not only the name and the place of the um, where the person lives, but it's also about the sexual uh, orientation, religion, health data, ethnicity, uh, and can be also identifiers used uh, online. So we really need to be uh, aware of this um, when we deal with personal data. Um, we need to respect the le legal framework in European Union, especially this is general data protection regulation. Uh, and also the national legislation, with, which can vary from country to country. Um, so the legal, legal ground um, quite often used is uh, when collecting data uh, on people is informed consent. This informed consent needs to be written very simple. It, needs to be uh, asked uh, what uh, you are collecting, how you will collect and, and process your data, and, and when, of course. Um, in this um, activity, it's very good to contact your data protection officers on your, uh, in your country or in your, at your organization. You go through the ethical reviews, and all of this can help you to improve your um, your uh, uh, activities and that you are on a safe side with processing personal data, especially when we are including children. Next slide. Um, as you can see, this can be very complex. Uh, you need to think ahead about many various questions and issues and so on. And from experience, uh, experiences, I can say that um, quite often uh, this is very stressful for researchers. Um, that's why it's very useful to, to use um, research data lifecycle as a model which illustrates the stages of data management and describes how data flow through a research project from a start to finish and that you structure your data management planning um, from, from the beginning until uh, the end of your project. And even after uh, your research is complete, you need to know what will be uh, with your data. So data research data management plan actually refers uh, to how you handle, organize, and structure your research data. It is a living document that changes together with the needs of the project and its participants. Uh, it needs to be updated through the project that so that you can be sure that it tracks such changes over time and that it reflects the current state of your project. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, at CESDA, we have actually um, developed um, a guide, which I have mentioned already before. Uh, it's meant for researchers who are starting um, their activities with research data management and they're not aware how, where to start. Um, and um, besides this uh, really extensive uh, uh, guide, you get also the checklist, This is uh, which is following the research data life cycle and its chapters. Uh, and for each chapter um, of the uh, life cycle, uh, you get very typical uh, questions that you need to be aware of before you start your research. And if you're not sure about how to answer these questions, you just go to the data management expert guide and you will find the solutions there. Or if not, you can also uh, contact uh, national service providers where 
data experts will assist you. Um, so the main goal of this um, data management planning is uh, data publication. Um, so data publication should be considered as a first class research output. Um, it should be properly documented with metadata, also reviewed for quality. And what is also important that it should be searchable and discoverable in, in data catalogs. Um, if you publish it with, um, with uh, data publishers, then you will get also the bibliographic uh, information, which you need to be able to cite your, your data and also that others can cite it if they use them. Uh, data publishers are the main specific trustworthy data repositories, such as those who are, um, uh, who are working under the umbrella of CESDA or CLARIN. Then you also have general data repositories, such as Zenodo, or institutional data repositories. Here I listed the repository of University of, of Ljubljana. Um, as I already mentioned, a um, very important uh, fact is that uh, actually you, uh, you, you cite, you get the, the bibliographic information to be able to cite your study uh, and that the others are able to cite it as well. Here you can see the example of our colleague uh, Matea Sedmak and her colleagues who published their, um, uh, their research uh, with the title Children's Voices uh, and subtitle Exploring Inter-Ethnic Violence and Children's Rights in the School Environment. So their study is published with our social science data archives and is available for further uh, uh, reviews. So this will be, this is briefly from uh, my side, um, and if there are any questions, uh, we will later in discussion try to answer them. Uh, now, um, I would uh, kindly ask uh, Markus Tuominen to uh, get ready to share his presentation. Uh, and while he's getting ready, I will um, introduce him. Uh, so Markus Tuominen is an IT specialist at the Finnish Social Science Data Archive. He has worked on multiple data catalogs since joining FSD in 2016. He is one of the people responsible for maintaining FSD's data catalog. And this year he has mostly worked on various EU, EU projects, for example, Coordinate Project. Uh, but he also worked as a technical maintainer for CESDA data catalog, and we are really happy that he's today with us and will share his experiences and knowledge uh, with us. Thank you, Markus. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Yeah, hi everyone. I'll be talking about data, data discovery. The focus is on CESDA data catalog, but I will also talk about and show a couple of examples using FSD's data catalog. So what is this the data catalog? Well, main purpose is to facilitate data discovery and support data use. And currently it contains descriptions of more than 37,000 data sets. Uh, well, this number is for all the languages. So around 27,000 data sets are in English and the rest are in other languages. It's mostly social sciences and health sciences, but also some humanities data such as historical data. And all the metadata in CDC is provided by CESTA's national service providers. Uh, currently there are metadata from 16 European countries so as you heard during Sonia's presentation, there are more than 16 members, but not all of them have their metadata in CDC yet. And CDC has a comprehensive user guide. So if later on, when you're trying out CDC, you run into some, or, or if you're like wondering how something works, then you can very likely find, your, find the answer in the user guide. And then feedback is always appreciated. We do read all the feedback and 
we have made some improvements this year also thanks to feedback we've gotten. So how to find interesting studies? I uh, picked some information about free text search and the filters here, but I will I will show how it works in CDC also in just a moment. So the free text search, it searches from all, all the metadata fields, but it does prioritize some of the fields when it comes to the relevance of the real results. So title is like most important and then abstract, but also creators and keywords. And the free text search uses and operator by default. So that means all the search terms need to be found. And there are a bunch of different operators you can use and they can also be found in the user guide. And double quotes can be used to find a phrase. And then uh, applied filters will always be reflected in the address bar. So the search can also be shared or bookmarked. Like I have a, one example here that I can click and So now I already have some like topic is already children. I already have search in the free text search. I already have collect and collection year set and everything. I can see that I found 39 studies with this, with this search text and filters. But yeah, let's go back to the beginning. So back to the front page. This is this front page is the search page. And on the left are the filters. On top is the free, free text search. And you can also select the language for the search. I'll just use English for this demonstration. So if I'm in, interested in uh, data about uh, child and youth well-being, I can, for example, find relevant topics like children or youth. And now we have 1,353 studies. And I can also limit it to, let's say, 2019, the last four years. And now it's 92 studies. And then since the free text search searches from all the metadata fields, I can, for example, if I if I'm interested in like cross-sectional studies, I can write cross-section. And now I find 44 studies thanks to that. Since there is no filter that would have cross-section in. And let's see. Let's say I'm interested in this result, so I can open it. I open it in a New tab by default, I think yeah, it opens in the same page. So go to the separate tab. Here you get all the all the metadata that is available in CDC. There's a lot of creators on this one. It's the permanent identifiers, abstract topics, keywords, a lot of fields for methodology. And then access information. And we'll talk a little bit more about access information a bit later. So yeah, that's one way to one way to search for results. Or I can just into like search for something with the free text so like school or if I write like this now it has to have school and class in it so if I want to have like either one then I need to add an operator this means now I still have over 10,000 studies here and then of course these results can also be sorted by title or date of collection or date of publication yeah it's really useful to also use the filters. 
to limit the results. Brief look into the shirts. Like there's a there's a lot more to talk about, but I'm I won't go into too many details. I will say that the well, like I already mentioned, the user guide is really comprehensive, so you can find a lot of information like how to improve the search through through some advanced advanced search, and it also has examples in this user guide. So for the when you found the study you're interested in, you probably want to download it. Uh, one thing to note is that the access conditions might vary quite a bit between different service providers. For example, FSD has four access levels, while UK Data Service has three. Although that's not that big of a difference, since they are generally somewhat similar, like the level with the most open access does allow downloading without registration for both of these archives. And I think the same is true for many other archives. And well, unfortunately, filtering the search by access condition is not currently available in CDC, but the work for it has started in this year. So hopefully this is something you can do next year at some point. And it will most likely be something like open, restricted, or unknown when it comes to the filter. It's as we saw in this example study from FSD, the terms of data access here is this one is available for research, teaching, and study. So this is this would fall under the restricted access. And also Data might be in the local language only, but some archives translate at least quantitative data files into English on request free of charge. Like I know FST offers this service. And yeah, now I will show some examples from FST's ILA data catalog. Let's see, open this. I'm interested in these two. So the one I already found previously, is Child Observer for Children and Young People 2019 and Child Parameter 2020. So I have this access study button here that I can use to easily get to the service providers data catalog where I can actually access the study. Well, now it's in Finnish, so let's switch to English. Well, here we have basically the same metadata that was that we already could see in CDC and maybe some extra ones. And then we have the download data that where we can actually download the data. And we can see that this one is openly available for all users without registration. So we can just click download data. And yeah, it's already downloaded. And I can quickly extract it here and show that it looks a read me also some information. And yeah, then you have the study with the data files and, and the questionnaire files and well, this is all detailed in the read me like, but you can actually get in the get in the zip file from FSD. So that's simple since it's open. And then this other one, since it's for it's for research, teaching, and study, it does require registration. So I'm not gonna show the whole process here, but but it is still pretty simple process, you just need to register. And 
example, if you are a student or a member of staff from a Finnish university or research institution, then there is a simple way you can, like, like an easier way to register here since we support uh, Haka login. But for everyone else, you need to apply for Isla, Isla account. Basically, you just need to fill this and then you'll get your account hopefully really fast. And now I realize that even though I've selected English, the service language is selected as Finnish by default, but yeah, you can switch to English. So you can actually get your emails in English, like all the automated mails and, and things like that. And after, the, after you've registered, then it's basically the same process as it was for the other dates. It's like you just click the button, but since you, uh, well, actually, yeah, then you can click the button, but then it still needs to be approved before you can get the, uh, like actually access the data. Yeah, that's download data. So it it might differ for different service providers, but it should be somewhat similar process for, for all of them, I think. Yeah. I suppose I have to set the timer to know how much time I have left, but, but uh, I want to show up quick preview of upcoming coordinate portal also. So this is work that has been done in coordinate project. It's a Horizon 2020 project. You can find the information here. I added the link in the, in the presentation. And the main source for it is CDC, but the all the metadata, all the data sets in there will be related to child and youth well-being. So it's a thematic or thematic data catalog. And it will also have some other sources, most likely. And there is an early development version, but the actual release is actually in early 2025, and it will be under a different domain, so not, not this one. But you can see that this is similar to CDC. It's using part of the same code, CDC. So after you've mastered CDC, you can most likely use this pretty well also. And yeah, it's still having work in progress. So there are some experimental things, some things might not work too well and things like that. So it's just a preview. So you can look forward to the actual release in 2025, okay. So. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Marcus. I believe that uh, things might look um, um, complicated for some participants, but for us who work uh, in, in the data archives, everything is quite clear. And if anyone has any questions, uh, we are more than happy to assist you if you try to access some data and you find some troubles or challenges, do not hesitate to contact us. Contact us. We are uh, real people behind the, the web pages and we are always happy to, to support you. Um, so now uh, I will can kindly ask uh, Inge to get ready with, with her uh, presentation. So Marcus will stop sharing and while in this preparing, I will uh, read about her um, deal. So Inge Stieben is associate professor at the Department of Sociology at Tilburg University. She works on data dissemination of the European Values Study, uh, is a co-author of the Atlas of European Values, 
published in 2011 and 2020. Uh, she's also coordinator of Erasmus Plus project, European Values in Education, in which interactive tools visually visualizing uh, European value study data were developed. And we are happy to learn about the, these tools and what is uh, available there for researchers dealing with uh, uh, child data on children. So Inge, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me and also uh, for being able to talk about uh, the Atlas of European Values and thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm, I mainly work on European Value Study data and the European Value Study, I'm not sure everyone knows, but it's a survey data project that has been around for a long time because they started in 1981 with collecting data in European countries and we ask uh, respondents uh, about what they find important in life. So it's about their values. And these values, uh, they have many domains. It's about religion, work, family, uh, politics. So there are many different uh, items in the survey. And a lot of researchers use the data. So that's nice. Eh? They're also, uh, you can find them in the says the, uh, databases. But we thought the data would also be interesting for a more general public, maybe. And that is why we first started with the paper version of the Atlas of European Values um, to disseminate the data. Uh, and we thought visualizations like graphs and maps are a good way to uh, represent the data, to present the data in an attractive way. So what we did is first have this paper version, which you can download in open access. This is the third edition uh, with the latest wave of the European Values. So you can uh, uh, download it for free. And in this atlas, we present the data in mostly maps, but also graphs. And we, yeah, we have some small texts surrounding it uh, to make it attractive for people. Um, following up on this, uh, we were approached by, uh, um, let's say, a teacher university. So um, universities who train uh, students to become teachers in secondary schools because actually this way of presenting the data can be used very well in education and actually in education at more levels than only secondary education also at primary education the highest groups secondary education and higher education students can then work with the data without doing real difficult statistical modeling uh, and they can still look at the data in both a descriptive way and also maybe a comparable way. And for that, a paper atlas is nice, but it is even nicer if you have interactive tools so that they can work with the data themselves. So that is what why we went to a, let's say, website version of the Atlas of European Values. Um, and I will go to this website now. So instead of doing the slides, I will try to see if it works. So I will stop share this screen and then I will, oh, I need to open it first. Just a moment. I th yeah, I'm a little bit less um, good with the techniques than Marcus because he was very quick with everything, but I think I managed. So um, I can type it here. You can go to the website, which is atlasofeuropeanvalues.eu. Yeah, we are here. Um, and you can choose your language. We have a lot of languages here, but let's stick to the English version. And actually, we have three sections in the web, uh, on the website which are important. First, there's a map section, which I will explain first. So you go to maps. And in this section, you can create your own map based on a question in the EVS. So there is, maybe you, we are all interested in children. So let's see if there are any questions about children in the EVS. And here you can see a lot of these questions. And they'll simply pick one. For example, a university education is more important for boys than for girls. And here we see the percentage of people who agree with that statement. Yeah, so you can hover over the country 
and you can see how many people agree that the university education is more important for boys than for girls. Um, then, um, well, these days you can also change colors because we've noticed that when you're presenting this on a screen, it may be better to use these colors. Uh, there's also data available around the world because this question was also asked in the world value study. Yeah, so you can also compare it maybe to other parts of the world. But let's focus on Europe for a moment. Because what you can also do is, okay, now as a student, you have seen these data and you've seen differences between countries, yeah? because you can see that in these countries, people agree more than in these countries. And maybe you're wondering, why is this the case? So we have a compare maps option, which I will click now, uh, because we also have some macro level, some country characteristics in there. For example, GDP, for example, GDP per capita. Maybe you think in more wealthy countries, people are more um, um, gender progressive. Um, that could be a link. Yeah? There are maybe some social theories about this. And then you can compare both maps and see if you can find a pattern. For example, in the richer countries, these is the, are these the countries in which people agree with the statement less? Yeah. So in this case, <laughs> it's not that obvious, but um, it, this is a, a way of, let's say, doing some sort of, um, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, analysis without doing the statistics. Yeah? So it's a visual inspection of the data. Uh, what we also have in it is that these are, of course, averages for the uh, for the countries. So it's the total pe population, and then you see an average. But we also have respondent groups in there. So you can click on this button, and then you can select, for, for example, um, um, uh, young people, old people, people who are religious, with different kinds of education, men, women, income. Uh, urbanization. So let's let's do, for example, education. Do the lower educated think differently about this question than the higher educated? So now I have here the answers of people who are lower educated, and I can do the same here. First, I have to select the question again. I have to pick the right one. And then select here the higher educated. And then we can see that the higher educated, in general, the color of these uh, countries is a bit less dark than here, which means that lower educated people agree more on the statement and higher educated people uh, agree less. Yeah? So this is also something sort of an analysis of the data um, by comparing these respondent groups. Um, so yeah, that's one way of looking at it. Um, what you can also do is change period. I will not show it now, but uh, this is data from the latest wave, 2017. We also have the data of earlier waves in that. So you can also make maps which compare different time periods. This is about the map section. So that's one part of the interactive tools that we have. We also have a different one, which is called Classroom. Actually, this is designed to do in a class with multiple students. And the idea is uh, that a teacher uh, creates a classroom um, and students answer questions which are asked also in the European Value Study themselves. And then the answers are combined into a certain dimension, and then we can see where the position of students are in this dimension. Well, um, I already created uh, one of these classes, so I will now uh, show you. This is the, the screen that a student gets. So we can type in a nickname. This nickname doesn't have any meaning. It will not show up in the graph because, of course, it's yeah. Um, uh, it can be sensitive, right, to answer these questions. It's your own opinion, and you don't want maybe to 
show it to the whole class, but this nickname is simply for your own purposes there. The teacher will give you the student code. In this case, it's this. And then you can you simply get some questions which are also in the EVS and you answer what you think uh, yeah, is the answer for that question. So I simply click now on some, some, some questions. So here's another one. Um, and then there's this statement. Do you agree or not that family life suffers when the woman has a full-time job? And then in the end, when the student has answered all questions, uh, he or she will exit the classroom. I will do so now. And then the teacher will show the results. And this is done in a classroom. And here you see with all the dots, these are where pupils are, where they positioned themselves. Here we have this dimension, which is called post-materialist values, uh, which were the questions about what do you prioritize that a government should do? Should it focus more on material things or more on post-material uh, goals? And the second uh, items, they all are related to gender equality values. Yeah? Do, do, do you think that men and women should have the same rights and the same kind of uh, roles, for example? And the higher the score, the more you agree with that. We also see here the average of the class. And if you do this in multiple classes, you can combine these data. Huh? So you can, I don't have that right now, but then there are more dots available, which is very nice if you have like an exchange with the school, maybe abroad, and you can see if there are differences. But what you can also do is here, add the data of the European values in it, because here we can see how the average in that country responds to these questions. And so for example, we have here France, so the average of France is here, and the average of the class was here. So they can compare themselves to averages of all countries. And again, we can here select also, uh, sorry, not here, this is the country, here, respondent groups. Yeah? So we could also say, I'm not interested in the average of the country, the total average of the country. I'm interested in the average of young people in that country. And uh, then they pop up here with the blue circle around it. Uh, and in this way, people can also compare um, their position with the position that, um, yeah, uh, Europe has, let's say. And the goal of all this is uh, two things. Um, first, um, work with data, get a feeling for data yeah, so that we are talking about averages, but that there are differences between groups of people, but also between countries. Second, um, to discuss these differences and similarities and to think about what, why are they there? Uh, to introduce some social science theories maybe into this discussion. And third, to think about the, their own position uh, because pupils, they have their own opinion on matters um, and it helps them to think, yeah, what, what do I think and why do I think this? So it, it is a tool to help them uh, communicate about their values, one could say. And in the end, the goal is also to maybe, yeah, if you look at this from a, um, a civil society perspective and citizenship education perspective, the goal is also to create more awareness of um, uh, different opinions, to create tolerance, or maybe also to think about in a democracy, you have different opinions. Uh, why are they there? So there, there are this, let's say, values communication part is, a, is also in, let's say, didactics a bit, um, a big part of this, uh, of this. And then if you go to the third section of the website, which is materials. Um, here we developed a lot of teaching materials for teachers in secondary schools mainly, but you can also use them in higher education to work uh, with the data. And there are really nice work forms that you can adapt in class uh, here. Um, you can look for subjects, but you can also look for what kind of skills do you want to teach uh, the, the pupils. 
there are instructional videos here to present, um, um, let's say, uh, how to work with the tools. There are some theoretical backgrounds. The, this is mainly on five domains, on migration, democracy, environment, solidarity and tolerance. We um, made a report um, shortly describing the main theories about this. Um, there is a short version and a long version because well, uh, not all students like to read long texts. And there are also some infographics and they look like this. So there's about democracy, for example. Um, yeah, what are theoretical perspectives here? Yeah, so different types of support and how, how do they work? Um, um, how are they linked? Yeah? So if there are differences between countries in this, for example, in political trust, where does this come from? It has to do with traditions and the functioning, but also the level of corruption and macroeconomic conditions. Um, here is the, the differences are shown. And then we also have some individual uh, characteristics we, which can make up, which can explain the differences, for example, income or men versus women. Uh, let's see, then I can quit this. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is mainly about the website that I wanted to show you. Then I go back to my presentation and then finish that. Let's see if it works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in the project, we work together with uh, uh, a lot of partners, also with schools, to create all these materials and uh, uh, interactive tools because we really looked also at the curriculum of things. And I would like to tell you about Next Step because the project ended, so the tools are available, the materials are available, but you, we will continue working on it. First, with a didactical approach, that's a follow-up Erasmus Plus project in which we really focus on how can teachers teach about controversial issues because they really struggle with this. And you can imagine that some elements, some questions and items in the European value study, they are kind of uh, sensitive to discuss in class. You can think about migration, you can think about tolerance, for example, for homosexual homosexuality. Uh, there can be really strong opinions about this in the class, especially in classrooms which are diverse or which are maybe also challenging because there are some lower levels of education or um, uh, different um, backgrounds of students. And in this project, we will uh, develop um, uh, videos and tools for teachers to handle this more uh, easily. Plus, and this is really exciting, uh, there is a big project which is called Info for Next Gen, in which a lot of the big social science uh, survey infrastructures work together. So it's not only the European Value Study, but also the European Social Study, the International Social Science Program, the GGP, uh, the EQS, and the European Barometer data uh, to make these data more accessible uh, to researchers and to the general public. And we, so we will build on this evalue tool, which is actually only European value study data and some items of the European social uh, survey data to make it even bigger and combine uh, data from all these data sources as well as uh, on more themes. Yeah? So now in the European value study, of course, there's a limited amount of topics that are discussed. So here we have data, which is more broader. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to work on this uh, on these tools. That's it for me. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you. And if you have much. any questions or feedback, I'm happy to hear it. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, colorful presentation, which really shows how important it is to to have this data from big international studies, uh, to have them published and to be able to uh, reuse them and especially for these tools which are useful to bring them to the classes and to to uh, to teach students how to to use the high quality data 
Uh, and now the, I will ask um, Dr. Matea Sidmak uh, to get ready for her presentation. Uh, Matea Sidmak is a sociologist. Uh, she's a head of the Institute for Social Sciences at the Science and Research Center Copper. Her research interests include ethnic and inter intercultural studies, migration and integration, management of cultural diversity, sociology of everyday life, sociology of the family. She is the leader of many national and international projects, the most prominent, the MeCreate project, uh, which is abbreviation for migrant children and communities uh, and the Transforming Europe funded by the Research and Innovation Grant Scheme in Horizon 2020 program. So uh, Matea, please, uh, the floor is yours. So can uh, Sonia, can we hear? Yeah, I can hear you. The clearly. presentation is okay. The presentation is perfect. So okay. let's start it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So uh, a nice hello is also on my behalf. Today I will present you some information in relation to data collection and challenges uh, in research with children. I will okay so the aim is to share some experiences uh, here on the right we have uh, four international research projects we were you know dealing on in the last years the last one was already mentioned migrant children communities in a transforming europe but even before uh, we were working quite a lot with migrant children and young people so most of my observations uh, most of the experiences I will share today with you is with a special vulnerable group of children, migrant children. But I believe that, you know, our um, observation experiences can be to one extent generalized to all children. So um, I will just explain very shortly what was the aim of the project. So it will be easier then to understand what we'll explain later on. The aim, the main aim, the overall aim of my great project uh, was to promote the social integration of different groups of migrant children in different European countries through a child-centered approach. And this is really important that we really wanted to use a child-centered approach um, in, uh, to the migrant integration at the educational level, but also when preparing a political recommendation. What is this child-centered approach? So in the last year, uh, we can really notice the shift from the adult-centric to the child-centered approach in research uh, uh, with children in general. This means that uh, until you know, until now, we were you know most of the researches uh, were adult centric. This means that the adult persons, politicians, researchers, teachers, professionals, and so on, were in the center, and the children were only the subject, or sometimes even the, almost the object of our observations. But now we are facing this shift that we want to put the children in the focus and even more. So we believe that it is important to include them in the research. This means to not only do the research on them, but with them. And uh, even more, we must consider them as an experts of their own lives, as the rights holders, meaning makers. So it is really important that we listen to them what they have to say about their own lives. So we 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 see them as the competent, as an active agents, and therefore in all type of researches, it is really important to consider their voices, opinions, experiences in all phases of the research. This means in methodology in the whole research process, but also when we are preparing the policy recommendations that will you know, consider them and have influence them. So this is this huge consortium, more than 50 academic institutions that were involved in this, this project. And very shortly, the research was conducted on migrant and local children in 10 countries and using different types of methodological ap approaches from participant observation 
to a qualitative and quantitative research, more concretely, art-based approach, collection of autobiographical life stories or interviews, focus groups, and surveys. And there were more than 6,000 children involved in our research, newly arrived migrant children, long-term stay migrant children, and also local children. Uh, so I believe that this short background is important to understand what I will explain you now about our challenges in four different phases of this research process. First is the preparation phase, when we are just preparing ourselves to know to conduct the study, then implementation phase, methodological, some methodological issue, and at the end, I will try to critically reflect to know what we find out. So preparation phase. Uh, in all, uh, uh, before we start with, with research, of course, we must prepare this ethical protocol. And also in our case, in each country, you know, uh, this ethical protocol was approved by the Institutional Ethic Commission, uh, plus uh, the ethical protocol of the whole consortium was also approved by the Project Ethical Board, and least but not least, also by the European Commission, Commission, who was actually the financer of the whole project. And what uh, should uh, contain this ethical protocol? Usually the ethical protocol, um, dealing with research of, with children, um, it's using, it, it's containing, sorry, some general ethical principles. But when we are working with some more vulnerable groups, as for example, migrant children, sometimes even children with disabilities and so on, we should address this special ethical principle in relation to these very concrete groups. In our case, this was, uh, these were you know, migrant children. In the ethical protocol, we should also include informed consent for children and for parents or guardians. This is almost must be. We were used, you know, 20 years ago when I started with, the, with the, this research with children, we were just used to ask parents, guardians, adults to give the consent, to give the permission, you know, to conduct the research on the children. But now, of course, these things are changing and it's really important that we receive both consents. And if the children are not prepared, to, to, to be a part of the study, we respect them before the, 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 the parents and guardians uh, uh, um, um, decision. So informed consent should include two things. First is information letter, very clear, short, child-friendly child written information letter and information consent. There should be an emphasis on voluntary participation and it should be very explicitly written the possibility to terminate participation at any time of the process. Of course, there should be also information about the anonymity, then how we will record and why we will record um, uh, the, the, collecting, the collection of data, use of data, then data storage, data sharing, and so on. Uh, in the ethical protocol, also methodolo methodology should be defined very clearly, what type of methodology we will use, why, how, and so on. Then uh, the information about the data protection, the protection of privacy of participants, and so on. Uh, but in the case of the international res researches uh, with children, we should uh, also address uh, some specific challenges in relation to this uh, cross-country comparison, country specifics, cross-country adaptation. And because we notice there are huge differences in different countries in relation to how we can, you know, assess, um, how we can get the sample. For example, in some countries, it's quite easy to get a representative sample for the whole state. This is the case of Slovenia because we have really great statistical office National Statistical Office, who is working on these things. In some countries, it's almost impossible to get, you know, representative sample of children and so on. Then we must culturally adapt the questionnaires and all other uh, measure uh, uh, measurement instrument and so on. 
In this preparation phase, it is really important to put some, some, some emphasis on the research data management plan. This means that we must actually write it, and this management data management plan should contain all the information about the data collection, how we will collect data collection, what is the purpose of this data collection? Is there you know, very clear connection about the data collection and the objectives and so on? Even more important is the information about the data processing and, and storage. We should define and think before we start with the research, which type and format of data we will collect, how we will um, then uh, what will be the size of this data we are planning to collect, how this data will be stored, where it will be stored, how this data will, will be shared within the consortium, research consortium and wider, how we will um, uh, reuse the data, uh, we will uh, pseudonymize, we will anonymize or pseudonymize this data and so on. And to whom this data can be useful, how we will, you know, um, uh, um, prepare the data that, that can will be used, can, that can be used in the future and shared and so on. Because if we want to address all these questions very clearly, it is really important for all the researchers to be in touch with the national data archives, because uh, working with them can give us a very good insight how to prepare all this data, how to collect all this data, uh, on what we must be really careful on, and so on. Then implementation phase. So before every implementation of any research activities, don't forget we should sign informed consent with children and also with parents and guardians if these children are you know, under the age. In the case, for example, of children who are, I don't know, institutionalized or, the, or are, I don't know, migrant children without, um, without parents who are traveling by their own, we are then uh, using only the sign informed concern by children. Uh, this should be enough. Uh, but uh, it is really important that we are sure that these children understand you know what mean informed consent. Cons therefore, consent letters should be written in a very simple way, a child-centered, you know, uh, uh, child-friendly way. Um, the the content in the in this um, consent letter, we said that the, the content, the purpose, and consequences, especially the consequences of participate of participation, should be very clear. The time is crucial. This means we, we, we must take our time. We must follow the rhythm of the children, not to, to be all, always to hurry up, you know, as adults usually are, also the, the researchers. It is important that we listen carefully during implementation phase to use very compassionate and sincere communication. We should avoid presumption, presumption as adult persons, as researchers, are those who have a lot of experiences and know the best. We should use simple and clear terminology so that the children and young people can understand us. We should use enough space, we should, we should leave enough space so that the children can ask and re-ask the questions if they do not understand us and that we can clear, you know, all um, unclear things through all the projects. What does this mean to use child-centered approach in this implementation phase? That we try to, to, uh, to be as adult as possible. This means that we should respect children's experiences, opinions, and feelings and not put our presumption, experiences, opinions, and knowledge, uh, you know, um, uh, before the children. Uh, what is also important to notice that children in general want to please us. Therefore, we must be really careful to not encourage this kind of behavior. Uh, if the children feel that they are in the, the inferior position, uh, they really want to please that, they want to say the things that uh, they think that we really want to hear and so on. We must be really careful here to not uh, fall in this trap. 
And in the implementation phase, it is very useful if we use appropriate methods and maybe start with some methods and then continue with the others. For example, it is useful to start maybe with some particip participatory observation phase or art-based approaches and only later on start with this more traditional, rigid uh, methodological approaches as survey interviews and so on. This is especially true when we are working with children and different type of vulnerable ch children, because children sometimes they do not have words to express. They don't speak maybe local language, maybe because of disabilities, they have the problem to express and so on. So to use alternative methodological ways, not only those where you can, when you, when, where you, you can use only the language and oral expression, and what is really important when you are talking about the intercultural, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, surveys, researches, and so on, it is also very useful to use methodologies that are not only oral oriented, because sometimes, you know, there are huge differences among countries, among different cultures, among, uh, among I don't know, uh, global south and sud. Uh, um, in relation to how we understand the questions. Methodological issues. So as already mentioned, some methods are more appropriate than the others, and some methods are more child-friendly. And especially though the, the, this more art, uh, art approach or participatory methods are, are those who are, who are better equipped to involve the children, to give them space to express in the way they, they want to be expressed. So art-based approach, it's a whole range of, of, of methodological approaches from um, uh, photo licitation, dancing, using body, photos, theater, and so on. But of course, as always, it is good to use a combination of methods so, do, so we can collect different levels of data. Finally, I want to um, emphasize research co-creation. It is really important whenever it is possible to involve children in the research process, either in the form of children advisory board. This means that the children are uh, you know, assessing our work. We are all the time in touch with them, you know, in, in assessing and reassessing our um, uh, sampling, how we will sample, uh, the the process of sampling. I will choose the sample of, of the research. Then that we are assessing with them the uh, the methods, the questionnaires, and so on. Or if it's possible, we can also include them as a co-researchers, so that they can be also involved in the in the um, collection of the data, also in the analysis, interpretation, and so on. Here we can the whole range of the possibility how, when, uh, and to what extent include. The children. Critical reflection, what we learn. We learn that is, you know, even if we had this very ideal, you know, um, and noble intentions to be child-centric, it's really hard to be child-centric. So we are living in an adult-centric world. We as others have power to overrule the children. We have the authority as researchers, te teacher, politicians, and so on. So it's really hard to be child-centered uh, because it's hard for us to be removed from this you know, authoritarian position. On the other hand, also the children, you know, they are all the time uh, seeing us as the authorities, especially in the institutionalized you know, environments. So if you are doing the research uh, with children in the school or in some other institution, if it's possible, it's better to go outside, for example, in the case of school, not to conduct the study in um, uh, in the classroom, but to go, I don't know, in the yard, schoolyard, or in the school coffee, or somewhere close in the park, and so on. Because even only the change of the space where we are conducting the study is changing this power relation between adults and children. And even if, for example, if we are talking a lot with the with the teachers, and then we are moving, you know, in the class, and we'll conduct the, the study with children, they are perceiving us uh, uh, as an authority, as similar to teachers. Therefore, if it's possible, you know, we, we, we should try to avoid um, uh, uh, intense, you know, contacting with the teacher and to enter in the, in the interaction with children as, you know, some outside person, which is not connected with this uh, 
uh, structure, which is usual in the in the power structure, it's usual in the school environment. The second thing, time is crucial. So uh, in all researches, but even more in researches with children, it's really important to have time, to have time, to give to children the time they need to start to talk about the things, to collaborate, to express what they what they want to express and so on. Methods matter. So some methods are more appropriate than the others. Then um, about the uh, uh, about uh, the ethic. Of course, we want to be ethical, but then we should reflect and ask ourselves again and again how truly ethical we are. For example, only in, in these small things, when you are talking about the voluntarity of participation, how truly voluntary is the participation of the children? If you are conducting the research, I don't know, in the school environment, automatically, if the children will, you know, identify us as a teacher, you know, friend, as someone who is a part of the institutionalized school environment, they give us, you know, symbolic authority and they will participate because they are trained, they are used to participate in any school activities. Similar is in the in the in the family environment. If we are entering, you know, in the in the domestic environment and we are asking parents and the children to that if the child can participate, I don't know, in the well-being measures measurement and so on, as for example, now we are doing in the guide, um, um, a guide uh, project, we notice that when the when the parents are giving the permission, children, they are giving the permission automatically because they are just following, you know, the, the will, the wishes of the parents and then this, how truly voluntary is their participation. Now we uh, we conducted in the last year, uh, the, um, the pilot uh, research um, uh, measuring well-being of children in Slovenia on the a uh, random sample or so uh, in the Slovenian case. And we noticed that some uh, children were uh, really having a crisis because they didn't want to answer. They were crying in front of the parents and before uh, in front of the, the person who was collecting uh, this data because they, they, they felt obliged to do it, but obviously they didn't want to, they felt frustrated. Then personal influence, influence of the researcher. We as a researcher, when measuring, you know, um, uh, children well-being or some when conducting some other research, it is really important that we reflect about our, you know, uh, influence because with our presence we are influencing. You know, we have our personal expectations, feeling, attitudes, and so on. We have some interiorized prevailing discourse about the children to be vulnerable per se, migrant children even more, and so on. Okay, and then the last thing I would like to, to address is this general reflexivity. We believe that every time we are, the, uh, we are conducting the research with children, it is important to write also some type of reflexive report. And in this reflexive report, it is really important to situating ourselves socially, emotionally, in relation to respondents and so on. Why? Because our individual position, who we are, for example, in my own case, I'm female, middle age, and so on. Uh, I'm not with migrant, big, uh, migrant background, but you know, I have some other features. This is actually influencing the whole research process. This is influencing my interest. This is influencing how I will, you know, um, uh, prepare the hypothesis. This is influencing my uh, my selection of the methodolo methodology and so on. It's also influencing how we translate data into theory. So this idea started in the 70s with the influence of the feminist, you know, theorists when they started to address that, it's, that the whole research act is not neutral, but is actually really strongly impacted by who we are and our responses. So, uh, least but not least, we must reflect when we are working with children but all the time these power differences, because uh, even if we, uh, if we, you know, uh, um, 
we involve ourselves in the least adult rule, if we are well aware about this child-centric approach, and we really want, you know, to be as neutral as possible, there is this power differences because we are adult, there are children, we have knowledge, we have longer experiences and so on. So this should be considered all the time. So thank you very much, Sonia. I'm, I'm open for the questions and some other explanations. Yeah. If you... Thank you very Please. much, Matera, for your presentation and sharing with us this really rich experiences with collecting data on, on children. So now we actually got through the um, uh, to all the presentation and presentations and I will give the word now to Irena um, to uh, sum up a little bit of what we have heard and also to that we go through the questions that were all already asked in the chat and to give some minutes also to to other participants who would like to to discuss the issues. 